Good afternoon. It's always a pleasure to share some of the educational stuff in front of the teachers you always have met and uh, Nama Bangalore and I am from Medanta and uh, I will be discussing something related to which we all do encounter in our clinical practice but before that I will be uh, sharing this quote by three methods we try to learn the first one by reflection which is the noblest one the second one by imitation which is the easiest form and the third one which I believe is the experience that is the bitterest one <laughs> and uh, to add this there are certain disclaimers before I will be talking about this topic I try to be an educator who aims to learn more than the training itself by delivering such type of academic uh, discourses and these are some of the initiatives I try to do in my short span of uh, I can say education and uh, I would be also trying to do something to change the way we the trainees should be learning maybe with the collaboration with my teachers so the topic assigned to me is something which is very uh, dear to me because I am working more in the nephrocritical care so approach to acute kidney injury and this is from the trainee's perspective if we will be summarizing there will be minimum 5 to 6 questions for the theory part and there will be a lot of questions in your viva and practical you will not get an examination where you will not get a long case or short case or viva without at least 20% related to nephrocritical care so that's why maybe uh, we thought of having a nephrocritical care society as a total whole. So the topics, the domains that have been again put is classification, biomarkers and diagnosis. Though Dr. Uh, Justin has started with the treatment part in the very beginning, but I will be pitching in and clarify why we want to do the RRT rather than first understanding the new essence of like what are the things we should know related to kidney injury. So today's talk will be a systematic approach that would be helping you uh, clarifying some of the uh, basic uh, the doubts, queries. There will be lots of conceptual infographics in this talk. I will not be having any of the like you know, straightforward statements. The, I always prefer to have three S in my talks: swift, simple, and structured. And I prefer really like working more in the nephrocritical care. So if we want to uh, start with acute kidney injury, it's not a, I can say a disease, it's a syndrome, first we need to understand. The second point which is very important again, it takes hours to days to have complete, uh, I can say constellation of the symptoms and signs in our patient. Often diagnosed, it's not that patient will uh, like always come with, I have a decrease in output, my creatine has increased, so I am suffering from AKI. Rather, he or she will be coming with some other digits to your ICU, to your OPD and you will be finding that AKI is one of the, uh, I can say, differential diagnosis or it is associated with your primary diagnosis. So that is point number three. And the clinical consequences which we all know, it's not only related to the urine output or acid base balance, rather <coughs> there will be many things that can be resulted from your active kidney injury. What is the impact of acute kidney injury? Why uh, I can say this type of uh, topic should be highlighted more for the trainees and the examiners normally expect that the examiners should not be uh, like confused in answering related to at least nephro related stuff because it is recognized as a major public health problem, acute kidney injury, not only related to infectious disease. Second one, it has serious long and short term complications resulting in CKD, resulting in like long term like post intensive care syndrome something related to that will be like overlasting development of CKD is one of the major complications if you are not able to diagnose and treat properly the acute kidney injury and finally it would be uh, incur high financial healthcare cost to the hospital, to the patient, to the patient's family now there is still time if we will be only talking about the complications and implications of AKI, it's not done. Rather, we can have some structure, some rapid diagnosis and some of the appropriate diagnostic workups. That is the essence of my talk as well towards the end. 
that would be identifying the aka types what are the types then only our treatment will be tailor made second point specific therapies are there right now apart from the rrt if you do that maybe we will try to reverse the injurious processes that is happening within the kidneys so these are the two objectives for which we should be knowing the classification the etiology the risk factors and the biomarkers which is part of my talk as well now what is the timeline of the evaluation if we we'll start from the classification in the examination it is a like very pertinent question to ask when it actually started the clinician thought about that yes acute kidney injury could be one of the uh, most important thing that could be contributing to patient's recovery you can see here it first started in 1941 around in patients not in the typical kidney patient rather in a traumatic crush syndrome 1941 the idea came that yes there is an entity called acute kidney injury and that could be i can say uh, after that you can see in the 1953 clinical course of arf people started to conceptualize in 2002 klm et al what we all know rifle criteria that actually started in 2002 in 2004 Each final rifle criteria came into the picture. 2007 Mehta et al for the Akin classification. Kediko came in 2012, and after that also the ADQI definition, the phenotypes of AKI. So many things are till now it is ongoing. So till now we are not very clear what could be the AKI course in future. This is a picture which summarizes the different types of kidney disease we normally encounter in our clinical practice. NKD is non-kidney disease. There is no kidney disease. Now there is a subset AKD, there is a subset CKD, and in between you can see AKI is a very sub small subset of what you can say AKD and CKD. The uh, the the intersection is you can see, and I will be clarifying. So if you see here, NKD, AKI, AKD, CKD. These are some of the nomenclatures you have to remember and simultaneously clarify your doubt. There are two criteria to uh, divide your NKD, AKI, AKD. That is functional criteria. One is structural criteria. Functional criteria is more related to what we do regularly in our bedside, your creatinine, urea, and in your structural criteria, it will say it is something. which we will be right now not able to actually quantify with using your baseline whatever biomarkers we have that is urea creatinine so we have something right now coming up i will be discussing that also in the later slide uh, your slides so aki is up to 7 days try to clarify aki is to 7 days first two days is the timeline we wait that patient may recovery so two days it will be the wait period Then from two days to seven days, it should be AKI based on your GFR, your urine output, your creatinine range. AKD would be seven days to three months. Three months or ninety days. More than ninety days, it should be falling into the CKD. So this is the the your time course. Now, if we will be going into the literature, thirty definitions of AKI is there in the literature, but there are only three. which is very important for our trainees or like our own understanding purpose that is rifle criteria akin criteria and kedio classification you have to answer this in examination mandatory now this is about a rifle try to remember but i am not going to shoot anyone here rather this is the initiative that has happened with acute dialysis quality initiative adqi in 2005 and this is the classification in examination you get a long question on this as well in the viva the examiner won't be having that much of time to like go into all these details risk injury failure loss eskd but yes you have to write in this classification gfr criteria urine output criteria i'm not going to detail this is something which i think you know but yes as for the sake of understanding you have to always in your examination don't write in theoretical form rather make a table Right, I would like this only. That would be quite impressive to the examiner, and they would not be going to detail about 75%, 50% all the details you have actually quoted rightly or not. This is a secret of writing and getting good. <coughs> Now, what are the implications of uh, rifle criteria? If I want to say, so a progression down the line, it would be the pure rifle criteria is actually R I F L E. It would be increasing the length of stay in your ICU. Increase length of stay in the hospital. 
high mortality, lower renal recovery, and maybe right now I can say that watch all well with rifles. Why? Like in 2004, they have divided this into functional criteria, structural criteria. Was all okay? I would say it was completely wrong. 2004, 5 after the rifle criteria, there were many criticism that happened with the rifle criteria that people thought about. Yes, we should have something different. It is not happening. It is not actually cooperating to our clinical practice. Now there are certain limitations. I want to like focus. It is not predictive. Urine and creatine criteria are unbalanced. Which one is the like the major part? It's not very clearly mentioned in the classification. They have not thought about it. Maybe they have done a very good job, but it is not very appropriate in our clinical practice. There are many criteria, urine output criteria are altered by diabetics, diabetes <coughs> hospitals. So if you will be having your diabetics, especially already pre-existing, maybe the criteria is not fitting into them. Urine output measurements may be inaccurate from center to center. Baseline creatinine, they have given a definition like baseline creatinine, but what is this baseline? Not very clear and robust idea. There are certain risk criteria which may not be sensitive enough. What is actually the estimated GFR, what is the true GFR, the guideline doesn't say in clear like uh, perspective what should be our approach. And finally, this classification doesn't try to attempt to differentiate between different etiologies of API. It is only a classification, some numbers, and that would be giving you some idea how you are approaching at the bedside. Now, then came the akin classification. Again, it is like something they have made it creatinine and serum, uh, like serum creatinine, urine output, and time. Only three things. This is again the classification. Again, not going into detail. It will be taking time. But yes, you need to remember in your exam you have to write. Now. Patients needing RRT, if the patient is needing RRT, irrespective of the etiology, they will be put in the stage 3, class 3. That is one important point related to Akin. There are many criticism to the Akin as well, after it has actually published in the literatures. They should be like you know, only within 48 hours. There are certain etiologies which would be more progressive, certain etiologies which would be taking some time. So maybe it would not be appropriately fitting into the proper way we should be classified. Patients subjected to RRT, irrespective of the indication, they have put in the class 3, the final stage. This is not, I, I think it would be a better idea to put for the region of toxicology. The patient will be not getting enough time for all those urea creatinine and your urine output GFR to be properly reflected. Significant variability in the local practice in the RRT, so that maybe every patient will be in the peripheries or in the quaternary center would be in the class 3. And then optimal state of hydration they have mentioned. What is this optimal state of hydration? I am not very sure. The clinician will vary in their clinical practice. And finally, there is no difference in the predictability ability of the two rifle and academic criteria about this API to be properly classified. So these are some of the criticism that has happened post publishing this type of classification. So maybe I would say if we will be uh, having a third home pair, it would be not. I would say that I can reflect in my patients properly. So then came this one, which is still now is somehow better in all terms for the research purpose, from the practice purpose, that is a KDGO. And you can see this is the urea create, like your serum creatinine, urine output, only two things here. And uh, this is the classification, not going into detail, you have to read it like you know, detail. But in summary, if I would say about the classification, the first section which Dr. Manjunath has assigned to me, there are certain improvements. Kedigo classification could be uh, one international coherence of research because this is very two important things are there. And criticisms are there always, but yes, we need to practice something or other. So Kedigo is actually right now the well accepted classification. Now, maybe this is in like the total, if you want to take a screenshot between rifle, Atkin and Kedigo, and you can summarize your uh, your question. Now Moving forward to the etiology, etiopathogenesis that will help in uh, like uh, understanding the biomarker as well as your diagnostic approach, you need to know something related to exposure factor, something related to high susceptibility population and some of the things that you can do so that your patient will not land up in AKL. Now, moving forward, what is standard practice since age old? What we are doing now? I would say we always believe in only urea creatinine and urine output. 
this is a standard practice. I am not saying that always we do, but yes, most of the centers will only depend upon to classify or like you know to label that my patient is having HKI. I only depend upon these things. This is the elevation in the serum creatinine is the gold standard. Today it is 0.7. Tomorrow, if it would be 2.1, I would say this patient is going into renal failure. But if you compare it with another important disease from some other aspect, that is acute myocardial infarction, if you go ahead from 1960 till 2000, it started from ADH, now troponin I and more functional markers are there. But if you see for acute kidney injury, it is creatinine, 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 creatinine. And the mortality is very high. Though with multiple therapies, now there is drastic significant reduction in the mortality in the acute MI. So we need something, we need something apart from this urea creatinine and urine output. So there are many limitations that is right now happening with the urea creatinine, but we need to find out some magic uh, like bullet that would be helping go out. And this is one important thing that I want to highlight. Change in the serum creatinine become apparent only when kidneys have already more than 50% damage. So we are actually losing our golden period just waiting for this urea creatinine to rise. So that is the message I want to like offer to my audience here. So this article came in 2021, Biomarker Waste Management of AKI, Facts or Fantasy? Just to uh, moving forward for you all to understand, what is a biomarker? Biomarker is a characteristic that we can objectively measure, that can be from the physiologic aspect, pathologic mechanism, that we can quantify also and we can also start some pharmacologic therapy and we can again monitor or like uh, check the label, the trend. So that would be a perfect biomarker and there are certain uh, characteristic of ideal biomarker that you should know. You should get it very immediately. It cannot be like you know, 24 days you are waiting and the biomarker will come. That will not be an ideal biomarker for my side when I am dealing with life or death. What is happening till now? If we can see, tip of the iceberg what we are actually looking at when we are looking at only urea creatinine or urine output. But what we are missing, there are many things, pseudo-AKI, the phenotypes of AKI that is hidden. So if we will be like guided by the biomarkers, <coughs> your biomarkers apart from this urea creatinine, maybe we can see that what we are actually missing. Just moving forward, what will be the possible roles of the Nobel biomarkers? Early diagnosis, differential diagnosis and prognosis. These things will be added apart from the treatment, RRT, your antibiotic dose correction, this would be something which we are not only trying to uh, like help you out in your mind patient. Rather, I want something else. Early diagnosis, prediction, that I want to do. Maybe these newer biomarkers will be helping you. So, if we will be collaborating with creatinine, what we are doing till now with the biomarkers, which are right now upcoming or we are using now, so it would be you can divide into biomarker plus but creatinine less or negative. It would be subclinical AKI. That means I can prevent my patient from going into the frank AKI. Biomarker negative, creatinine negative. No functional damage, no structural damage. So my patient is safe at least. If your biomarker negative, creatinine plus. So I am dealing with something pre-renal azotemia. That means the functional damage has already occurred but structural damage has not occurred. So it is pre-renal. If I am giving fluid, I will be like assessing my patient, I will be removing the risk factor, maybe that will be helpful. But if biomarker plus creatinine plus, that means it will be more of intrinsic API. So that has already resulted in ATM. So just moving forward, there are three types of biomarker. I will take two minutes. Stress biomarker, damage biomarker, functional biomarker. What we are using in our ICU, the area creatinine is, what is the type of biomarker? It would be more of functional biomarker. Yeah, it can fall into damage biomarker, but we want stress markers for the better assessment of our patients. Now, more than 20 biomarkers are right now available, but maybe urinary biomarkers would be better suited to our own clinical practice for the reasons that it cited. So, there are certain proposed mechanisms of increased biomarker. You start from here, there will be increased synthesis in the extra. I can say renal tissues in the blood, you can see here, here, then release of this uh, from the circulating immune cells that would be coming to these renal vessels, there would be as a result what would happen, the blood will be containing increased biomarkers. Now there would be also happening in the urinary tubules, impaired reabsorption in the proximal tubule, increased synthesis in the tubules and you will get it in the urine. 
So both blood and urine will be reflected. Now, just moving forward. So if you will use your biomarkers properly, so maybe you can have better AKI phenotypes. And these AKI phenotypes should be septic AKI, hypovolemic, post-surgery, heart failure, trauma, rhabdomyolysis, so on and so forth. So these are some of the various biomarkers that would be depending upon the region of the like your uh, this urethral and ureter and the kidney system where the actually it is happening. So just take a picture because time is actually very short. And you can also make it early detection biomarkers, diet diagnostic markers, prognostic markers, and NGAN, cystatin C, Kim 18, all these are like more relevant in our clinical practice. Just moving forward, if you will integrate the biomarkers, we can find out there is something related to the green side, something related to progression side, which is the red side. Now, the diagnostic workup, if you will say, in the final, the final part, I will take one minute. I can divide my AKI patient into three parts. Pre-renal AKI, increasing AKI, post-renal AKI. Post-renal AKI, we are all clear. This is the box is very small. But if I want to divide my patient from the critical care point of view, I am more focused with the pre-renal AKI, where I can do something. I can intervene at the earliest, so that my patient is not going into increasing AKI. And in increasing AKI, you can see here, vascular disease, globular disease, tubular disease, interstitial disease. We all know these are some of the systemic things, some of the core medicinal point parts we should be very thorough about. But pre-renal is something, reduced effective arterial blood volume due to hypovolemia and the reduced effective arterial blood volume but alteration in the fluid shift. So we need some workup, not push-ups at the ICU. So the workup for me would be, I should be reviewing my patient's history properly. First of all, record the review. Since when the patient is having this type of problem, even now could have decreased, patient is having swelling, everything. Second one will be the typical hemodynamic assessment that we all normally do. Urine analysis and urine microscopy, very basic things. Sometimes we normally do not pay that much of attention, but that gives you very good inference about your clinical examination. Determination of urinary indices like FENA and functional expression of urea. Catheterization, measurement of the post boil residual urine volume to know if your outlet obstruction is the cause. Fluid challenge when you are suspecting that this pre-renal AKI is due to hypovolemic status. And finally, there would be certain radiologic studies like ultrasound to look for obstruction, CTKUB, or putting one like you know, internal catheter itself. And kidney biopsy would come in the last. So this would be my diagnostic workup. Now moving forward. This is a very systematic algorithm. I will be finishing in 30 seconds. Acute kidney injury, you know from this classification increase in the serum created in more than 0.3 in 40 liters, more than 1.5 times baseline in last 7 days, and urine output is less than 0.5 ml per kilogram for last 6 hours. If my patient is fitting into this and coming to your ICU, what I will do? I will go for a very thorough clinical history as well as physical examination and do some baseline investigation like CBC, basic metabolic profile, FENA, urine microscopy, osmolarity, post volume residual renal ultrasound, which I have already mentioned in the last slide. Now, moving forward, I will again divide things to first post renal. Difficulty in body, poor urine output, BPS, bladder distension, post renal. And the management is very clear. I would be excluding with your, my either ultrasound or CTQ. Now, come to that will be post renal. Now, come to the second part. If my FENA is more than 2%, and urine uh, sodium is more than 40, urine osmolality is around 300 with active urinary sediments that would be falling into the infringing category, the middle one, which is more of a core medical. Now, if my uh, first part would be evidence of hypovolemia, I am excluding that the drug history is not very suggestive and if FENA is less than 1%, urinary sodium is less than 20, urine osmolality is more than 500, it is highly concentrated. And bland urinary sediments, maybe it would be pre-renal. Now, if I would be focusing on the urine biochemistry, this is the classification, you should know. I am not going into detail, and the urine analysis microscopy, you all know. When you will be having your WC cast, when you will be having RBC cast, when your blood will be having only renal tubular epithelial cast. But you should know, practice at the bedside. So finally, if I would be summarizing everything, my AKI patients, I am doing all these things, the possible etiology starting not only with the pre-renal, that is hypovolemia, rather 
abdominal compartment syndrome, TTP or HUS, rhabdomyolysis, myeloma, sepsis, cardiorenal syndrome. So you should remember this is a very good algorithm approach and you can all read it, try to understand, memorize and in your exam if you get, rather than writing a page, if you write down like this, you will get I think 10 out of 10. So in conclusion, this is a KDCO suggestions how you should approach or like go for the diagnostic workup for the patient with AKI. Arteries, stage 1, stage 2, stage 3 and what are the things you should do? Starts with all your blood loop assessment, avoiding or stopping the nephrotoxic drugs, then going for invasive diagnostic workup, finally avoid subclavian catheter, that is very important. If the patient is going into the failure and end stage kidney disease, rather put in subclavian catheter because patient will need the fistula catheter. <coughs> And some of the things that we do, I uh, request you all to join on January 12th for this global international nephrotic care webinar, which will be uh, by some of the uh, reputed speakers worldwide. And uh, thank you all of you for your presentation.